Hi, so first things first, don't worry, I'm going to be doing a follow-up video on the Neon Plasma display that we spoke about in the last video. Uh, it is proving to be quite a lot of work to get it into full graphics mode, but I do have a PCB that I'm working on. This is the third revision. Um, I'm getting there, and hopefully in the next few weeks I'll get a video out. It's, as I said, proving pretty difficult, um, but either way, I'll get there, and even if I don't, I'll put out a video about why it failed, but I'm sure I'll get there eventually. But this isn't what we're looking at today. Today, we're looking at these. Numitrons. So if I was sent back to the 1950s and knew nothing about electronics, and someone asked me to design a numerical display, this is probably what I'd come up with. Many people who see Nicti tubes think they operate like these, actually. These are just fancy light bulbs. They're seven segment displays with incandescent filaments for each segment. In my previous Nicti tube video, um, I demoed that Nix is a cold cathode by grabbing the, the display, the tubes. It turns out you can just do the same with these. Even though they operate on incandescence, they don't actually get very hot. They just get slightly warm to touch. And that's because they operate at a cooler temperature than a normal light bulb. What I've never really figured out is why these took so long to be invented. Um, they were originally marketed by RCA in 1970. 1970! How did someone come up with high voltage neon tubes to display numbers 20 years or so before coming up with a glorified light bulb? In fact, RCA actually came up with these while they were in the process of imploding themselves with the CED player. I'll link a great uh, video series by Tech Connections in the description. Anyway, the, these aren't RCA pneumatrons. As is tradition on this channel, these are the Soviet knockoff version, IV-9s. And these six in this display here were manufactured in 1979. So, why would anyone use pneumatrons? Um, they existed in this weird period, just before LEDs were practical. A cheap numerical display was very much in demand, but these don't look cheap. They require a glass vacuum envelope and some quite advanced manufacturing to get those filaments in place. Uh, the main competitor was the Nixie tube, which we've talked about before. So I had a good think over why anyone would want to choose these over Nixies. So, they may have been cheaper. I'm not sure about that, to be honest. They do have less internal components. They work better in the cold. Apparently one of the most common uses, uh, particularly in the US, was in uh, fuel pump displays. With these being incandescent, they're full spectrum. So we can put a colour filter over them and we can get the display in any colour we want. This was the only object I could find, purple, but you can have any colour you want. And even more excitingly, I found an example of this in the wild in an old uh, retro games cabinet. So uh, here we go. That's actually an advantage of LEDs as well. Um, they operate at low voltage, so Nix is uh, around 200 volts. Um, this isn't actually that big an advantage now when, when we're playing around with them as, as vintage electronics, because it, it's very easy to get a, a step up to high voltage. But I imagine in the 70s, um, it was far easier operating with higher current instead of higher voltage. They have a wider viewing angle than Nixie tubes, actually, because the digits aren't stacked on top of each other. They're easier to see from the side. Um, and the failure mode, they're not subject to sputtering or cathode poisoning like Nixies, so you have to worry less about uh, maintaining them and writing in anti-cathode poisoning um, when you're programming. There are some disadvantages. Um, they're incandescent, but they low voltage, which means they have a high current draw. Uh, that caused problems on this project, actually, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, the brightness varies with uh, unstable voltage source. So even I'm powering these with um, USB, but when sometimes when multiple digits light up, you can see them kind of flickering as as the um, as the voltage drops. You don't get that with with Nixie tubes. It's all or nothing. They're either on or off. Uh, the refresh rate is slow. So what, when you watch as they turn on here. You can see, I'll put that in slow motion, actually. Um, you can see them kind of ramping up and ramping down as, as they heat up. Uh, yes, it does look nice, to be honest. They're not designed to look nice, though. Um, 
they have ambiguous failure modes. So, for example, uh, you wouldn't want to use these in certain applications uh, where you need to quickly look at a display and get a correct value. So, for example, if um, if you lose if the bottom filament blows, a three could look like a seven, um, which obviously could uh, cause issues. Um, the, pr probably the the biggest disadvantage to me is that they're doubly inefficient. So because they're incandescent, they produce heat. They they use a lot more electricity than um, than something like an LED. But also they're inadvisable to multiplex. So all of these are turned on at the same time, unlike Nix's where I I was multiplexing them. So I use far far less power. Let's talk about how I'm using um, these tubes. So I've recently milked. Uh, move from kind of building dedicated gadgets to instead hooking things up to a web-enabled microcontroller so I can display whatever I want on them. Uh, so with the Neon Plasma display, I did, did exactly the same thing. I can display whatever I want on that as well. Um, I've hooked these up to an ESP32, which fetches data from an API. Um, and I've actually built a few custom APIs which sit on Docker containers on this Raspberry Pi. So this just sits somewhere in my house. Um, pulls information from various sources and I use fast API to to uh, to write write a few custom APIs which which this hosts. Um, I'm using the display right now to retrieve data from um, open weather. Uh, they, they have a free API so I'm getting live weather data here, uh, temperature, humidity, wind speed, etc. Um, the main use I, I designed this for was actually for a machine learning application. So for my day job I'm, I'm actually a data scientist um, and to explain what I'm using this display for, I suppose we need a crash course in neural nets. So I spend a lot of my time training up neural nets. Um, I've got one going on my, my own PC here right now. Um, and one of the, the big factors with neural nets is training runs can take a long time. So a training run is just the time where the model is looking at data and, and learning patterns, basically. Um, Training runs are split up by epochs, which are basically just steps, training steps. So by knowing how many epochs you've already done and how many you have left to go, you can sort of see the progress of the model. Um, along with something else called a loss function, which is basically just saying the performance of the model, it's saying how well it's learning. So I wrote some custom Python code, which integrates with an existing uh, popular neural net library called TensorFlow. Um, and what this does is it sends those two metrics, the loss and the epoch number, over to the API sitting on this Raspberry Pi. And then the ESP32 in here listens out for changes to that API. And if I either start a model or one is running at the moment, it'll interrupt anything else being displayed here and display the loss and the epoch number on the pneumatrons. So I can have this sitting on my desk and I can monitor any training runs that I'm doing at the time. Now, if um, I'm not training up a model, which is most of the time, it reverts back to something else. So I, I have it here set to revert back to showing the weather data again. And so there's always something on the display and it'll just automatically update if I start training up um, a model. And then, as I mentioned before, um, we can display whatever we want on this as long as we can get the information to the microcontroller. So um, here I'm doing what I did in the last video. I'm doing the uh, Russian vehicle losses live update here as well. Um, little detail that I forgot to mention is that the OLED display as well, very cheap, simple solution. So that just tells us what's on the display. So when I was building this, I kind of wanted to go with a sort of rugged aircraft aerospace kind of look. So um, I used one of these um, aluminium enclosures to put it off eBay. Um, I milled out this window in the front myself using um, using my milling machine. To be honest, I, I might actually make a separate video about the milling machine slash lathe uh, one day, because that's actually um, a vintage piece of equipment that I restored myself. But enough of that, let's get this opened up and have a look inside. All right, so here's the board. Um, I'll be honest, my circuit design isn't brilliant, so what I have here is the ESP32 sitting over half of the board, which straight up caused issues with physical debugging, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, there are a couple of bodge wires as well, that, that's fixed in the, in the repository now, I just um, I got ground and 
and five volts the wrong way around. So yeah, classic mistake there. Um, so at the heart of the design, we have six of these shift registers. So a real difficulty with this board is actually getting hold of the shift register. So when you say shift register, a lot of people think of this uh, 74HC595. I couldn't use those because um, the current draw is far too high, hence having to, to get these slightly more obscure ones. Um, the problem was, at the time I made this in 2022, there's a global chip shortage, um, and the cost of getting hold of six of those was actually more than getting hold of the six Numitrons. Um, so in the end, I went with the uh, the tried and tested option of just getting um, cheap Chinese knockoffs. So they're, they're almost certainly fake, um, but they do work, kind of. Um, you may have noticed at some point that sometimes the uh, top filament in that bulb doesn't work. The filament's fine. It's just the shift register. There's something wrong with it. Um, it might have been my dodgy soldering, but of course I can't get under here to fix that. So I'm happy to live with it. Um, even more hilarious, sometimes it does just randomly work as well. So for all I know, it might have been working the entire time in this video. But yeah, that aside, it's a pretty simple schematic. We just have the microcontroller into six shift registers. Each shift register just, um, drives a single Numitron. Um, the ESP32 has an onboard voltage converter, so it's capable of supplying one watt in total. Um, by my calculations, if all of these Numitrons are lit with all of the filaments, um, it's about 600 milliamps they draw, so there's a, there's a fair margin there. Um, you will notice, however, though, that when, um, when we display a new number, it scrolls across, and that's because if I try and light up more than about three at the same time, it drops the voltage enough to cause the microcontroller to brown out. So we have to do everything gradually, um, hence the sequential lighting up of digits. And that actually took a little bit of thinking about how to, how to actually do that. So when I'm using vintage electronics, I tend to try and run them under spec to prolong the lifetime. Um, these are no exception. These are designed to run at 4.5 to 5 volts, according to the Russian data, data sheet. But I'm running them at 3.3 volts. Um, assuming they're similar to the RCA Numitrons, which they basically copied off, um, the design life is about 100,000 hours at 5 volts. Now, filament lifetime is actually proportional to empirically somewhere between the 12th and the 16th power of applied voltage. You heard that correctly. So just taking the lower bound of that gives an on-rated pipe up on an, a re-rated on paper lifetime of like hundreds of years. Now obviously with them switching on and off like this, um, I imagine that's theoretical only, um, but I don't expect these to fail anytime soon. Um, these are running at about 900 degrees centigrade. You can tell that by um, holding them up to a black body color chart. Um, and a typical incandescent bulb burns over two and a half thousand degrees centigrade. Um, an RCA publication states their Numitrons were spec for 1,400. So I really can't see these failing anytime soon. Uh, the result is they're slightly dimmer, but they do have more orange colour. I think it looks quite nice, actually. Oh, uh, by the way, um, when you see claims of uh, world's oldest light bulb, or, you know, light bulbs that have burnt for 50 years or whatever, uh, they exploit this principle. If you've ever seen one of them, they just run it under voltage. Uh, sorry to disappoint you there, by the way. Um, this is why I don't multiplex them. So the original product brochure from RCA actually recommends multiplexing these. Um, just looking at them, you can see there's a significant ramp up for, from, for them to reach visible brightness. Watch for them turning on here. Um, so the only way to stop that, because with multiplexing, you're switching them on and off quickly. So they'd never actually, you'd never get a decent display. So the only way to speed up that ramp up is to apply a higher voltage. So RCA recommend actually running these at 12 volts. The idea being the filaments heat up quickly, but then the voltage is switched off before they overheat and break. There's no way I'm going to do that. If I make a single mistake, if the microcontroller has a brownout, if there's a coding error where a filament gets stuck on, that's it, it's going to blow. The rule that I just mentioned that suggests at 12 volts they'd just blow in a couple of minutes. Um, in reality, I'd be surprised if it lasted more than a few seconds, to be honest. Um, as well, since incandescent filaments, they become more conductive as they heat up, multiplexing wouldn't actually use that much less power than direct drive. 
there'd be less components. Admittedly, the most expensive components here were the shift registers. I'd only need one of them if I was multiplexing. But it's not remotely enough of a benefit for me to try. I'm perfectly happy with them as they are. I don't really understand why Numitrons came on the scene as late as they did. I've heard they were quite popular in aviation due to reliability and the readability. I mean, who wants high voltage tubes in a plane? Um, but aside from that, it surprised me that they took so long to invent. They do look nice, and I'm sure these are going to be sitting on my desk for a while. But yeah, hopefully I'll be back soon with an update on the plasma display. If it takes me much longer than a few weeks, I might do a video about neural nets in the meantime. But until then, thanks very much for watching, and see you soon.